Hello, everybody. Welcome to Perme Ethos TV, episode two. Today we have with us Marcin Jakubowski. Now, Marcin's a Polish American who came to the U.S. from Poland as a child, and during that time, things weren't great in Poland. Uh, he, when he got here, he graduated with honors from Princeton and earned his Ph.D. in fusion physics from the University of Wisconsin. He was frustrated with the lack of relevance to pressing world issues during his education, so he founded the Open Source Ecology in 2003 in order to make closed loop manufacturing a reality. He began development of the Global Village Construction Set, which is an open source tool set of 50 industrial machines necessary to create a small civilization with modern comforts. A great idea. His work has recently been recognized as a 2012 TED Senior Fellow in Time Magazine's Best Innovations of 2012 and as a 2013 Shuttleworth Foundations Fellow and a White House Champion of Change in 2013. So we're, we're very excited, very happy to have Martin with us today. And before we get into the presentation, I'd like to show you a quick video. So the Global Village construction set is basically like a starter kit for a civilization that, that would allow you to provide a high quality of life, modern standard of living with just the most simple, basic set of tools. For example, if you eat, you actually use a tractor. If you drive a car, you, you actually use CNC robots and CNC milling machines to produce those cars. So yeah, throw those in a set. So we came up with this whole, whole set of tools. I was always an independent thinker, like I would always think deeply about um, about making a better world. I was definitely committed to that. And when I saw all the problems in the world, like, you know, people starving and wars happening all over the place, it's like, man, how can we be so ignorant still? You know, we've got all this technology. It's like, let's evolve people, please. If we truly shared and allowed each other to build on each other's work, then we could go way further. We can enhance innovation and creativity way over the present standards. The open source platform allows for anybody to download, change, modify, use the designs as they like. We're very open about that because we think that's the way to, to change the world. Like, for example, the compressed earth brick press. I tracked down the guy who, who developed that and I talked to him. Uh, and within hours, I able, was able to download a lot of the key information that he learned over a lifetime. If we can show a way that, that we can provide sound economics for everybody on the planet, that's, that's the whole thing about open source economic development. So um, taking what exists and making it better, essentially, to make it a truly good solution for everybody. All right, so that just gives you a glimpse of what we're gonna be talking about today in, in much more detail. And so I'd like to welcome Marcin. Thank you, Marcin. Thank you, Josiah, glad to be here. Just for everyone's reference, you can um, see our work at opensourceecology.org. The most frequent reports happen at Facebook, so you can see Open Source Ecology on Facebook. If you have any questions, please contact me at marchin at opensourceecology.org. And the most recent project, which I will talk about, is called Open Building Institute. And for that website, you can look at openbuildinginstitute, one word, dot org. So a little bit about me, what led me to this project. So I was born in Poland a small country that's in the middle of Europe. And uh, we do have a history of, of war that's pretty relatively recent. I mean, it's Second World War. And during that time, my grandfather was in the Polish underground derailing German supply trains. My grandmother was in a concentration camp. So those kinds of thoughts of, of the scarcity and, and conflict are, are more alive 
perhaps than what we know in the States. So when I left Poland in 1982, this is the scene from my hometown. These are Russian tanks. This is not a parade. This is a real, real story. What it looked like in the great times behind the Iron Curtain when we had martial law and I would have to, things like food were rationed. I had to wait in line for hours to get things like, like butter or meat and things like that. So then things got better. I ended up um, going to Princeton uh, for the undergrad and then graduated from University of Wisconsin <clears throat> Madison with a PhD in fusion energy. And that's when I discovered, as in the next slide, that I was useless. So during the last year of that, that pro program, I started open source ecologies. It's a project that builds upon the open source software movement of open collaboration and brings that to the realm of hardware, where instead of open source code, you've got open source blueprints for everything which are collaboratively developed, that people are welcome to do whatever they want with them. It's uh, basically open documentation, transparency in the way we do things in order to make a better society where more people have more access to economic power, ultimately. So open source to us is a powerful force we can say political force in that sense because it's not about people playing around with uh, with hardware, but but hardware is is eighty percent of the economy. It's a powerful economic force that can be more open, more transparent to people when we operate in that by sharing openly. So that's that's the whole story uh, around which the framework around which we work. So then, right after the the PhD program. Uh, after finishing that, I said, okay, need a clean break. Let's get some land. So we settled on 30 acres in, in the middle of nowhere, Missouri. It's Maysville, scenic Maysville, Missouri. This is where we are right now. It was a blank soybean field when we got on it and we began to build. And why land? Because all the wealth comes from the land and it's about having the resources to, or the tools to convert those abundant resources into, into modern civilization, that, that's the key. So for us, it's about building and enabling machines based on, a, on the goals of, of freedom, where to me, the most essential kind of freedom comes from our individual ability to turn those abundant resources to free ourselves from material constraints. That's how I define freedom from the material perspective. So here's, here come the machines by 2011, we built uh, eight different prototypes, like the tractor, the brick press, other things. And you can see by 2013, we had a number of different prototypes uh, that kept, kept growing and growing. At present, there's about 120 or so different machines that were built, 16 unique prototypes, and a couple of dozen replications in about eight countries around the world. The brick press has been most replicated. There's 12 different machines of that around the world, which is our most developed machine. I know that there's two people right now in different parts of the world that are actually building with the machine. But altogether, I'd estimate we're about 25% done. But the, the milestones we've achieved are, are six main ones. So the first one is that people actually can replicate our work. This is uh, James Slade from Texas, who is our first have a replicator. He downloaded our plans from the internet for the brick press and, and out of the blue sent me this picture. And when he sent that, I thought, wow, that looks like a Photoshop copy of our machine. And no, it's not. It's a real, real machine he built. First replication by downloading our plans and, and building that completely independently from us. So, so we know that people can actually do that by the digital world. You can download blueprints. And if you have a welder, and a torch, you can build this thing uh, yourself. And we encourage that. So this is becoming replicable. We've had a number of these replications in different parts of the world. This is an, another replication in the US. Power cube, that's our universal power unit was replicated. That's in the United States. There was a, a replication location of the tractor in Pasadena, California by a group of high school students. 
a a build of a tractor didn't work well that ended up breaking in a sugar refinery refinery in guatemala so people are doing this all over the world uh, this is a brick press that was built in italy they were starting to actually in italy they tried to to get an operation building the brick presses, but they ran into a bunch of legal trouble in the sense that they're much more strict about permit you know, permissions for manufacturing there. So they, they kind of gave up on it there because of regulatory issues. That was a, a replication of the brick press uh, in China, that's actually, uh, by a person who worked with us here then took it out there. I don't know, if, I don't, doesn't look like they're producing that because I haven't seen this flood the market yet. <laughs> and uh, this was a tractor built just for an art show in Turkey. Another brick press built in Texas for a project in Africa. And that's, I believe that's currently in use. And another guy in Texas. So Texas seems to be our favorite state. Who's actually, this guy is actually building a house right now. He added a, um, uh, basically a conveyor so that the loading is much easier so that you can put the soil at the bottom of the conveyor through a sifter and you don't necessarily need a loader to load the machine itself. And this is perhaps our most salient example of what can happen. So this is actually a, what looks like a brick, brick production facility with two of our brick presses and four of the power cube, universal power units, hydraulic power units, this is in Nicaragua, where they're producing bricks and building houses, like, like this one, which is just somebody on the internet just um, emailed me that, and we're trying to follow up to see what they're doing there, because it would be great to, to learn from their feedback. You know, what are they learning? Is it working for them? How well is it working? Where the, do they have troubles with the machine and so forth? So the whole point is to get data from all over from people contributing back to the platform to make things uh, documented and more transparent the way we do that is we, we document a lot of that on our wiki which anyone can edit and contribute back to the knowledge so the second major mile, milestone that we've achieved is radical uh, efficiency of the actual builds we've achieved a single day build of the brick press back in 2012 where a team of 12 people got together and by virtue of module based design which means that there's a number of people working in parallel on modules because we designed the, the machine to be such where people build independent parts they all fit together and then at the end we assemble them rapidly so you can get down to a single day of production and the way you can do that what we used are IKEA style fabrication diagrams where everything is really transparent and clear. And we use digital fabrication, which means the parts were CNC cut on a, on a laser cutter. Actually, the steel was such that all the pieces fit nicely. That's done for you prior to the build. So you can achieve a single day build when you have all the raw parts. And then you weld and torch things and make it happen all in a single day. And with this example, the machine itself, that's, that's the team that built it. The machine itself, just a couple of notes, it makes 5,000 bricks in a single day. Um, these are four by six by 12 inch bricks. The machine costs 5,000 in parts. The nearest competitor that sells a comparable throughput machine will cost you about 50,000. So there's a definite economic case for doing this in the open source where you have access to blueprints and then community-based manufacturing workshops can do this. Our, our vision is to, to distribute such production facilities. So you can think about community supported manufacturing, like you have community supported agriculture. Well, a different model where instead of the global supply chains, you have much more power on a local economic scale due to the fact that you have digital fabrication, the ability to share designs online uh, at low cost. So in principle, you can make the most advanced products anywhere, which means, which indicates leapfrogging and prosperity for everyone if we really take advantage of this amazing option. So radical modularity is one of our key achievements. 
And what that means is that we use a, the absolute minimum number of parts that are the most, most flexible in their range of applications. So it's basically a construction set approach, meaning that uh, in the example of the tractor, you have the, the tubing that we use, which is, you can build anything out of that tubing in terms of structures. We have uh, the universal power unit on the back of the tractor, which can be used in different applications. We have modular wheel units, which can be used on a tractor or for other applications, like for a trencher or any other rotor, anything that's a rotor, you can use that. So for example, the same, absolutely the same part right here can, can be used to drive a track on a bulldoze, things like that. So we make it absolutely as modular as possible down to the point where the entire global village construction set can in principle fit in a 40 foot shipping container. So a civilization reboot kit, um, with the smallest number of parts by using a, a construction set type of approach. The power cube is our modular hydraulic power unit, which consists of an engine that, that you, uses a hydraulic pump to make hydraulic fluid at high pressure, so it's a hydraulic power source. We've run this thing on, on a gasifier as well, but we interchange the unit between all our different devices. This powers the tractor, the brick press, anything else. So not one dedicated engine, but many of them, and you can stack them. So if you want more power, you use two of them, or four of them, or eight of them. So the practical limit for us is, is uh, we're getting up to 200 horsepower. So that would mean using up to eight of these power cubes um, on one device. So the same kind of box beam tubing can be used to make frames. This is a frame for a CNC torch table or the same kind of box beam tubing can be used for an iron worker machine, which we built. And this is the actual picture. So the advantage of that being that we can now build these devices extremely rapidly, but you can see how the same parts can be used in radically different purposes. This is a, a semi-precision production machine, it uses the same kind of frame material as our tractor. Okay, this is the universal rotor. This is just a simple high power, high torque hydraulic motor connected to a shaft. And this can be used to drive wheels, tranchers. In one instance, it's uh, that same, what you saw just there is driving the trencher. So actually in this picture, you see the trencher and the wheels on the tractor are using the identical, and we mean identical rotor, that that same same device. So that's that's an example of the, the modularity or that that universal rotor can be used in a in a tiller or salt pulverizer which we use for preparing the salt for the brick press or this um heavy duty string trimmer which we used as a, just a simple prototype it would need a nice guard for you to to make it marketable <laughs> but you can do crazy things up to doing things like a honey extractor this actually worked remarkably well just a single double comb on the extractor in a 55 gallon drum using our identical uh, universal rotor and literally was able to get a high power very fast extractor. This thing was fast. You can turn it on and shut it down immediately and it was actually quite practical. We were able to extract all our honey relatively easily using this. So by using this modularity, we achieved our next milestone, which is pr the prototyping cycle reduction. In instead of spending months to build a machine, we, we now can build certain machines in a matter of days. So look at this blue iron worker machine. That took us, it was the first iron worker machine to, to shear slabs of steel, one inch thick steel or angle uh, or to punch holes. We built that in six months for the first, first prototype. And then we said, okay, this is way too expensive in terms of the amount of labor that goes into that. So we said, okay, let's strip it down to the absolute minimum of what you can do. And essentially, we build the machine that you see on the right-hand side out of the box beam tubing with two people in 24 hours. So that's a totally different story in terms of feasibility. That means you can um, make that actually cost-effective. And it's still, uh, the performance of that was quite good. The, the blade gap, so it basically is a large scissor with two heavy-duty uh, blades, but it will retain like a 7,000 blade gap consistently when cutting um, using a very simple design. So if you get smart about it, you can, you can achieve things in various different ways and make it much more simple. 
similarly, we were able to prototype our backhoe. The, both the design and build happened in two weeks. So that's a good example. I mean, two weeks to build this is not bad. Once again, using the, the box beam tubing, simple pivot plates and other bonding plates that are bolted together. And it didn't work. No, I mean, it, there, were, there were issues on a pivot element itself. Otherwise, there were, um, it, it does work except for you have to get the next prototype of work out the details. Our next, our next iteration of this will actually be a 360 degree version because just the, the great amount of flexibility you have from a 360 degree backhoe. Uh, the pivot part is always a challenge because you can only get so much motion side to side. So we decided to just bypass that issue and go 360 degree in the next one, which we're gonna be building uh, by next year. So what you're seeing uh, is that we follow a construction set approach. Not only can you build one machine with the set, but you can build a large number. That applies to the mechanical devices like the tractors, the backhoes and trenchers, bulldozers. But the same kind of principle can apply to other areas as well, like power electronics. So if you if you build a universal power supply made of somewhat of black boxes that have certain functions, you can build anything from a welder to a plasma cutter power supply to power conditioning for a big windmill, all these kinds of different things. If you understand the small pieces, and our goal is to make it so transparent that you don't have to have a PhD in electrical engineering to do that, but you can literally plug and play with that with basic knowledge and um, just like a computer, you don't have to know what's inside to be able to use it. That metaphor applies quite well here. So we're trying to extend the construction set approach to all areas, not just mechanical, but also to the electrical, the precision machining, fabrication, renewable energy, all, all the different sectors of society. And I'll mention this 3D printing construction set. That's actually, that's a recent, recent, uh, um, Josiah said you're quite interested in it. But for example, if you design a scalable 3D printer XYZ axis, then you can make this a flexible machine. So our current goal is to design a 3D printer platform to be expandable in size. So you can do a full like five by 10 foot torch table or a laser cutter or a router table. So you can design it with the extensibility or enlargement in mind, so you can do other things. And with the 3D printing, we're talking about things like uh, recycling polycarbonate, which for example, like CDs are made of polycarbonate, grind it down, extrude into filament, and then print 3D, uh, 3D print uh, multi-wall greenhouse glazing. That's one of the applications we're interested in. Uh, we're interested in plumbing fittings. We're interested in things like rubber tracks because rubber is a thermoplastic elastomer. You can actually 3D print that. So the 3D printer can be extremely useful for various applications. And currently we've got, um, we've got a workshop coming up in Belgium in, in September, but actually we're, we're going to run one in, in December, Josiah, actually for you, uh, for your reference. So people can actually sign up for that on the Kickstarter as a reward. Uh, it's a current campaign that we're running, but okay. Uh, let me talk about the real-time documentation part. Um, with documentation, that's the key to make it to make this replicable. You have to take the energy to to document it, do the instructionals, and that's a hard part. Nobody does it effectively because it's just too much work. But what we did is in our process is we had a Google Hangout running live. We would uh, take pictures, upload them to the internet. We were talking to the Google Hangout people with the progress and step-by-step -step things. And at the same time that we built the machine, other people were there remote in the cloud uh, creating the instructional. Not only that, we took video footage and uploaded that directly to YouTube and a video came out as well. So as soon as we were done with the build, we had the instructional the same day and a video the day after. So that's um, you, you can use the internet to and do effective documentation if you set up the infrastructure for that. And that's, that's very powerful 
It's all about this time binding, the idea that humans have this unique capacity to build upon past knowledge. That's an amazing capacity that few other species have, if any. So um, we can really leapfrog and, and get to, to an advanced state by having that, uh, leaving a paper trail. Now it's a digital paper trail that works. Now, the last point I want to make about the, this is a, a serious point of development. How do you generate revenue from this? Well, uh, all our stuff is open source, so, but that doesn't prevent somebody from simply taking the plans and building it. We can do that, and we do do that. Uh, so one revenue model is simply you do the physical production, and, and people always ask, well, isn't somebody going to beat you to, you know, beat you with competition? Well, that's the point. We want to have access so that there's free enterprise. I think that's a, that's a generally accepted principle. <laughs> it's called free enterprise. And the open source is the, the limit of that. It's, it's you're just uh, competing on an equal playing field with, with others as opposed to having artificial uh, companies being artificially propped up by special interests and investors. So the, to, to us, that's the most effective, efficient kind of economy. And I think uh, if you look at the progression of the economy, I think open source is the natural default that's going to happen when people, uh, when companies get more and more efficient at things. So I think uh, from our perspective, open source is the future. The open source economy is the future, and that's why we're working on it. It's uh, Though many people don't recognize it, so it's a, it's a hard game because for all practical purposes, the open source economy does not exist. It's like a millionth of the entire economy. It's It's doesn't exist for practical purposes but okay so the revenue model what we're doing in particular we like the idea of educating people and building things at the same time so we're combining that in, a, in our model of extreme manufacturing workshops so we we host weekend events or single day events where we build a heavy machine or a 3d printer or or a house in five days and we can sell the product and we can charge people for admission for an immersion training course. So, uh, for example, with the brick press, we produce the brick press uh, using this method, and we were able to, to net $10,000 from the tuitions and from the sale of the product. So that's the kind of model that we're trying to promote for the framework of community-based manufacturing. I think this can spread virally once there's good product design and the open source flexible fabrication micro factories are found and they're st stacked with open source industrial equipment, your CNC torch tables, even industrial welding robots and all of that. There's no limit to what you can do. You can do that at much lower cost when it's open source because you're at essentially paying uh, for any built device at the cost of materials. Our general figure is that steel is about a dollar a pound. So machines tend, I mean, the, generally when you look at a heavy machine, it should cost about cost about its weight. It's a dollar a pound, kind of like, like tomatoes. If you're gonna do efficient builds, you're gonna have to have well-refined workflows. This is just an example of how we were planning out a large number of people to be stacking brick walls using all these pallets of brick. So it's, you have to get it really straight and well organized so that it can happen in these effective time scales. Uh, next, um, that prediction there was four hours for, for laying all the walls of the, the brick walls. That didn't happen. I mean, we had much, uh, much to learn. It's possible. We, we we're still going to do that. But we found that certain workflow issues got in the way. So we always learn and, and see how we can do better. But those, those amazing production times are, in fact, realistic and they get better and better. This is a scene from a brick pressing workshop or tractor and brick press, the bricks uh, coming out straight out, out of the ground into the walls, laying the, the bricks. These, these are, uh, we built a number of micro houses, uh, like 150 square foot micro houses in the past. Now we're building larger structures. And we could, we're combining the brick press work with standard panelized construction using carpentry, which do, doing that because the bricks are heavier and they take more time you can still get these amazing build times like this structure which was altogether 600 or rather 800 square feet we were able to build that in, in a five-day period and everything is designed such that all the panels everything else 
is designed so that two people can actually carry that. So we're designing that for human, uh, human-centric design. This is an early micro house that we did. The first one we did in the middle of winter, the brick press and power cube in the back still. We expanded that quite a bit to the point that that's, that's the version as of two years ago. Since then, we've added an aquapana greenhouse to that. So that's the back addition on, on the left-hand side is the 800 square foot addition uh, after that was built. That's the interior. So you can see it's very nice. It's got subfloor hydronic heating. You see the, the white walls, that's brick plastered over. And then an the interior walls are the carpentry. So we're living with all the developments that we do. We test it, we test it directly. We really, you know, we're, we're dog fooding it here. It's like reinventing the modern, like a modern day of, um, modern day version of barn raising. It's kind of a, a good metaphor for that. We're trying to make it practical because these kinds of experiences are, are really fun and, and educational and productive. The kind of model that we're trying to develop is, a, is an organization like the Linux Foundation, which does, um, which does the Linux kernel, the, the, op, the open source operating system. Uh, we're trying to do that for open source hardware. So that means a small team that, that runs a much greater, a large global development effort. So for example, the Linux Foundation has a $6 million budget and they're able to gather a billion dollars worth of software contributions, software programming time every year. So that's that's an example of how global collaboration can work. We're trying to develop that for what that looks like for hardware. Now, the critical uh, question we're trying to answer is this one, 85 equals 3.5 billion. And that refers to the 85 of the world's richest people have as much wealth as the 3.5 billion at the bottom of the pyramid. That was two years ago. After Actually, that figure got down to the 50s, like something 57 or so. Uh, this is not getting better. It's a, it's a significant issue of social equity, environmental justice, all of this. Um, while prosperity happens, it doesn't get distributed to everyone. And that's, that's not good. We, it's not good for anybody. As the gross domestic product keeps on increasing, the genuine progress indicator is stale or, or decreasing. So quality of life for everybody on this planet is not really, not really increasing and we should do something about that. And that's the whole point of the, the distributed economy is one way to address that. So you, you move away from the large centralized power structures to a, a more equitable world that's much more distributed and localized, the more sustainable, all kinds of and regenerative um, as a result. So machines are good, but it depends how you use them. If you know, if we're not opposed to large machines, but can they be feeding a more just system that's on a smaller scale? If we have a wide base of open source equipment, we can we can create much more wealth in local communities. And that's the idea behind open source machines. And these days with 3D printing uh, and advanced machinery like that, people can have immense power right on their desktop or within their own communities. It's like having a, a factory right on your desktop in some way. So the potential with modern technology is amazing and we're trying to create access to that um, because that's power and when I, first built one of the first tractors, I mean, that was an extremely empowering experience for me, seeing that, wow, this thing works and it's, it's doable. Um, you just feel an, an amazing amount of power by tapping your own productivity. And it's something that uh, once you experience that, it changes your life. It changes how you look at your relationship to the world, makes you more secure and, and, and stable in your approach to, to your own life. So humans are not motivated by a big carrot on a stick, uh, though that seems to be how it is. But when you look at it more closely, it's there are several much more fundamental human drivers that make us tick. And that is the, the pursuit of autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Those are fundamental drivers, whether we know it or not. It's, it's, uh, that concept has been popularized 
this is called self-determination theory, popularized by Daniel Pink in his TED talk about the surprising science of motivation. Uh, you should take a look at that TED talk. That's Daniel Pink, The Surprising Science of, of Human Motivation. Um, so, yeah, so opening up access to productivity is our key goal. We have ambitious plans for the next 20 years. Um, I can send you a link to the OSC 20 year roadmap where the endpoint is an open source economy. And what is that? It's, it's, it's a framework where people have an authentic option to pursue what they really desire because access is fully there and people have the tools and, and knowledge to get there. And to me, that means that innovation shoots up through the roof when, when access is open, just like I saw in my own uh, grad school. I, I should share that. I, in grad school, I was not able to communicate openly to other people, other groups or other universities because we had some hot materials and people were competing for funding. So when I thought about that, I was like, wow, this is extremely wasteful. What would happen if we really collaborated with one another? We can increase innovation. And that's the way I think about the current patent system. It's, it's pretty much suppressing innovation. People say, that, oh yeah, it increases innovation, but the case could be made to the opposite. Okay, uh, we operate on, so we wanna make things open. The, first of all, the open hardware design. We're also open sourcing our enterprise blueprints, like how do we build things? And, and we also take that to the next level, which is open sourcing how our organization works. How do you, you know, how do you incorporate? How do you do your accounting? How do you run a production event and so forth? We're trying to document everything as we go along. And we work on hardware because hardware is still 80% of the economy. As much as, you know, Apple and Google, all the app, the app world, the virtual world. Um, the physical economy is still about 80% and the software is 20. So that's not likely to change. And that's why working on open source hardware is very, very important. So this is a slide of uh, that documents what open source is about. And it's the first, you can say the first historical example of open source. And that's back in the first industrial revolution. What you see here is the efficiency of steam engines during the time of Watts reign in the late 1700s, early 1800s. But what happened in this story here is Watt had a patent on his steam engine and then it expired in 1800, at which point we saw that the innovation level in terms of getting the efficiency of steam engines shut up. It actually it went up by about a factor of two. And that is because the, the people after Watt, they actually shared their innovation openly. They started a journal to communicate their findings. They didn't have internet at the time, so they used the journal. And if you look at the historical artifacts of this, there was an authentic increase in innovation that was measured. And it's not just some you know, some artifact that oh it's some something weird happened and things just kept going up. If you look at the details of this, you can trace it back to the to the fact that there was open development happening once the patents expired. And that that was responsible for the growth of the efficiency. But even though we have these historical precedents like this from early early history, still Apple and Google spend more on patents than they do on research and development. So the question would be, what if they actually use their, their value to, to innovate? <laughs> I mean, I think there's a case that innovation would be higher, but instead people spend a lot of their energy in protecting themselves keeping information away from others to get their competitive advantage. And that's a model we live in, but it's not necessarily efficient or optimal or, or good for the world in general. It benef definitely benefits some people, and but it, not everybody. For us, it's about extreme access to all the tools of productivity, production, efficiency, and that's kind of basically what I wanted to communicate. And maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit now about our new initiative, the Open Building Institute. 
and turning out a product that's that's that everybody can understand and that is a, a modular ecological house so our next initiative it revolves around building here's our product a 700 square foot eco starter home which is loaded with ecological features that can be built for under twenty-five thousand dollars in materials so that's that's our next goal we're basically open sourcing the entire framework, which includes the actual design. We, we have a library, at the heart of this is a library of downloadable modules that you can work with in open source software. This open source software is it's called Sweet Home 3D. And you can design var a various number of structures. If you want to click on that Kickstarter, it actually has some, some more compelling um, Click on that. It shows that's like the quickest introduction to that because it talks about the modules that we have that you can download and then you can use to build your own houses. And uh, if you scroll down, um, this kit includes the ability to build houses and greenhouses. Scroll down, if you may. Um, the design part is one you can download the parts and design your own structures. That's an example of our aquaponic greenhouse, which has got aqua, got tilapia and, and vegetables, some examples of the stuff we've built here, uh, the library of modules. But we're, we're, we're um, fundraising to kickstart this project uh, on more levels than that. There's the library of downloadable designs that are both for complete structures and the modules themselves, which you can use to design your own housing. The second part, that we're developing is a training program for builders because we can do this now we've, we've demonstrated we can build a, a, a 700 or 800 square foot structure like back upon a greenhouse we build the whole thing including the systems in five days the addition that we did last year we built in five days so now we're going for a complete eco house that's stacked with these ecological features if you go down a little bit there's a diagram of all the ecological features of our starter home we are actually going for the highest standard of regenerative construction, which is the Living Building Challenge certification. So using our simple building techniques, we're going for the most advanced criteria of regenerative design. Now, beyond that, we're also taking one step further. We've got machines to produce materials, like the brick press, uh, et cetera. So we're also, developing the open source materials production facility so that anyone can have local materials wherever they are. The idea is, of course, uh, there would have to be a large number of these facilities worldwide. So that's why the plans are all open source. And this materials production facility includes production of, of compressed earth block, stabilized block, production of lumber, production of concrete, Lime, burning lime to make limestone, to, from limestone, burning limestone to make lime, that's a well-proven decentralized technology, so we'd like to do that. And from there, we can stabilize the, the bricks. We're also including the large format 3D printer to print multi-wall polycarbonate glazing. We've got insulation production, like uh, cellulose, cellulose insulation as well as paint production. So it's pretty radical that if, if we can build these materials from local resources, then, then we can have a nice local materials option because housing is the biggest polluter on the planet. The construction sector emits 39% of all the carbon dioxide emissions in the United States. So if you go much further towards uh, local materials production, then you're much better off. Our main idea here that's represented by this picture here is, is that of incremental housing. So we're proposing a 700 square foot starter home, which is designed for expandability. So instead of getting laden with debt up front, you can buy a smaller house or build a smaller house and then expand as needed. Now the average price of a house in the United States, new home in the United States is 360,000 according, 360K according to the U.S. Census Bureau, and we're aiming for a package where we produce the same for 25000 in materials plus $10,000 of a service fee. The way this model works is we organize 
a five day extreme build event for a client. We have all the design. We come in and in five days, the whole thing is built starting from the foundation. So it's not like we're importing uh, factory made panels. They're all getting made on site with a large team of people working in parallel. Our idea is that for $10,000 of a service fee, we organize this process and the, the house, house owner gets a house at a small fee above the bill of materials cost. So we're literally talking about housing access now at 10 times lower cost than the industry standard. Now, how do you go about the land issue? Because that is gonna be one of the main challenges. Well, in the United States, there's many, many different infill uh, urban lots or wherever, the, on Zillow.com, you can find a lot of parcels, buildable parcels that are $10,000. You can actually find ones that are like 5,000 in the, many different places. So in the United States, it's not too bad if you wanna build your own house. And that's the, that's the segment we wanna go into. I think infill housing is one great application. Um, other people have suggested like building small homes for, for veterans. Uh, it's another application people talked about. But basically um, a framework for low cost building that we're developing is that's our main next project. We actually um, sold our first, for the highest reward, we're actually offering a build of a studio, of an eco studio. So we actually sold the first one of those. Someone supported us on that yesterday. And we're actually offering one more of those as well. Uh, so with that, yeah, if, you, if you'd like to see open source housing become a reality, please support us on a Kickstarter um, and make that happen. We found that this stuff is difficult. I mean, building a house is a complex project. So next year, we're aiming to start an immersion training program um, a pilot's pilot program, probably two to four people, where we're teaching people how to do this entire process and contribute to an open source product development platform, both for housing and the supporting machines that are involved. So please support us on the Kickstarter. We're still live for like 25 days from today. And uh, I'd like to open it up to questions at this point. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Excellent. Thank you very much, Marcin. So I, I have some yeah. things I definitely want to talk about. Uh, could, you could go ahead and uh, share your, your, your face, your camera. Yeah. There we go. Uh -huh. All right. So the, uh, there's, there's the intellectual property um, discussion, I think, mm -hmm. is a very important one and one that I get a lot yeah. on my side because um, because of my, my political views of, of um, an anarchist point of view, uh, and, and I get that a lot, is, well, what about intellectual property? Well, uh, to me, the big thing with intellectual property and why open source is a much better model, um, or just the, the, even if it's not open source, the removal of intellectual property uh, is that one, just like you had mentioned, uh, people aren't wasting all this money on lawsuits and um, patent protection uh, where they could be spending that money on innovation. And the other big right. one to me is that it's stifling innovation by uh, not allowing people to copy. So uh, that's the big thing that people have a hard time getting their heads around. And for good reason, it's a very important discussion is that um, people would just be able to copy your product. Well, I think that's a great thing because if someone's able to copy my product and make it better, that's going to entice me to then further develop and beat the person who's trying to copy me. And if it's a concern over someone just being able to take your idea and then um, make money off of it, well, there's a couple of things there. One is that if you're first to market, generally, you're going to have the larger user base and people are going to trust yeah. that more because you have more experience with the product and you created the product. So the likelihood of someone just copying it, being able to innovate as well as you or be able to support that product as well as you is, is a lot lower. Um, but even if they did, let's say 
Apple makes this great product. Google comes in and, and snags it up and takes that same product and makes it better. Well, I think that's great because it's going to cause Apple once again to see that and have to innovate even further um, to, to beat their major competitor instead and, and spend money on that instead of spending the money on suing uh, the other company mm -hmm. to, to, to stop them from innovating. Yeah. And it's, I mean, we f we're forgetting basic print principles. What is free enterprise? I don't think the original definition of free enterprise, whatever that may be, uh, includes the fact that we're creating monopolies as part of that system. That's a, that's a corruption of the, of the very concept. And probably Jefferson would be rolling in his grave when he's, if he saw what's happening today. Now, the other part is the, the viral clause in open source hardware or just the licenses. We use a license which, which, which has a share alike. We use Creative Commons share alike. That means that if somebody uses it, they're required to put the new developments into the public domain, essentially, so that others can use it as well. So that's, that's a legal thing that we can do. And I think it's a good idea. It would have to be, it's not been proven in the world of, of um, open hardware. Uh, the licensing issue is still kind of murky in the sense that nobody tested a real case of where if you require your product to be open and someone copies it and doesn't share, can you actually force them to share back into the, the common pool of knowledge? It all gets into this, this mess and law and all of that. I mean, so the easiest solution would be if people transcended <laughs> their psychological bounds or, or really evolved as humans to say, hey, hey, it's a fundamental value that we simply share. We learned that in kindergarten and, and every, you know, since then, we've been beat over the head to not do that. You know, you, you know, you talk about getting a job, you got to be all proprietary. The culture of competition or just this proprietary culture is stifling. Uh, I don't think people like it, they just accept it because they don't see any other option, but let's create a new operating system for this so that uh, the innovation explodes through the roof. And it's a really a question of mind shift for people. It's just gotta access a different level of consciousness about it because you can think one way or the other. You can, if you believe that sharing is good and others can share and it works, then you'll make it happen. But if you're scared, and you think you got to protect yourself, you're going to act accordingly. So it's really about a shift in human consciousness that this, this requires for a reason. It's somewhat difficult right now because so few people have, have this culture, uh, uh, authentically have that culture. Because what I've also seen is that a lot of people uh, abuse this open source context in the sense that when they, they all claim or talk about open source, but once they have, a real product that sells, they shut it down. So it takes courage, I would say, it authentically it takes courage for people to be open. You're vulnerable to unknown and lots of potential things happening. Yeah, but absolutely. we're and live, right? We really see this in the technology field. Um, if you look at the internet itself, you know, the, the, that could have been patented and controlled, but it was decided that it would be better if this was shared mm -hmm. in the world and look what it's come into. Now it's available everywhere. It's, it's a great, great system because it was made free and open source. Right. And also though, to add to that, however, is the question of net neutrality. I mean, net neutrality means that you're every kind of content has an equal share on the internet as opposed to somebody pretty much monopolizing what content exists. That's a, that's a violent battle that's happening right now throughout the world. I mean, companies like Facebook are trying to create their, their platforms, which violate that. And if we are not vigilant about it, we're going to lose it. You know, so, so people have to be aware, like even on the internet right now, it appears to be free, but if we're not paying attention, little encroachments will happen where 
net neutrality is violated in one case and then goes worse and worse. Now, hopefully that doesn't happen because too many people are paying, there is a lot of people who are paying attention, so we could be good to go. But definitely if there's, if there's the evil genius out there, uh, clearly someone out there would, would love to have that because then if you control the, what people control the knowledge in the world, you, you're controlling the world. So definitely uh, we have to watch out that we don't let that happen. Yes, absolutely. And you're absolutely right. Net neutrality is is a, a huge uh, hot topic. And it's something that government would love to uh, love to just be able to take over and corporations, of course, the corporations mm -hmm. are in government to force these laws um, to take over um, certain aspects yeah. of the internet, which uh, is a horrible idea. And uh, the uh, the next oh, I, oh, this is a long a big topic that uh, we could spend many hours on uh, right but just you know just to add for people who haven't been exposed to that just look into internet.org what is that well one side of that is is it's a plan to take over the world by compromising net neutrality while it's being positioned as free internet for for the poor people just look at the other side yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the phone companies. If you if you look at the history of the, uh, the the phone companies and their monopolies, and it just is it's a lot of history. And I think it's definitely uh, worth really researching because it, it's going to yeah. have a huge effect on the world, especially with being able to share, like what we're doing right now, being able to share this information with people freely mm -hmm. and and open sourcely, um, and and inexpensively. No. Yeah, just to add, just to add to that point, because uh, my wife Katarina Mota, she did her thesis on open source hardware and the history of some of the politics around that. So I can send you a link to that. That's that's important seminal work about how this freedom uh, can be maintained in the world. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Please send me the link. I want to include it in the show notes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The next next topic I wanted to get onto, yeah, when you were talking about the modular building of houses, the time like the small houses, um, mm -hmm. building them up, um, I just wanted to share something that I've been uh, kind of working on um, and trying to accomplish is that what what my goal is to do is to have uh, many small properties, so between one and five acres, maybe up to twenty acre properties in different locations throughout the uh, throughout North America and to just have those properties and build a so for example I have a, a, a Dodge 3500 it's a Dodge Ram Cummings 3500 and what I want to do is take the the back off put a flatbed on and build a, um, a camper basically to live out of this would be a full-time mm -hmm. camper and be able to travel to each one mm -hmm. of those properties whenever I want to and build my food for mm -hmm. and things like that in each of those properties and that was uh, very inspiring to see the the work you're doing because mm -hmm. the same kind of thing I want to do with just it's just on a truck uh, instead of a, on, a, on a house but I'm thinking man I could do the same things on each of those properties where I could come in and modulize um, different mm -hmm. aspects of the property and the value that each property would bring. Um, I imagine there's going to be different resources in each property and therefore I'll need different um, um, sheds and, and chicken coops and uh, all kinds of uh, lumber mill and, and things like that on each property. So it's yeah, I mean, you know, I could see that each of these parcels maybe focuses on a resource that's especially fav favorable there. And the question is, what's the revenue model there? Is it just like a rental thing? Is it actual production of goods and services? For us, we'd like to create a large number of these campuses worldwide where we're educating, we're producing. So creating a real substance of an economy on all these parcels. So it's, it's, a, it's the same idea. We definitely have the idea of, of picking up more parts on the road where we're creating these campuses for dedicated regenerative open source development. And the business model there would be education and production. So that's what we're working on right now. And personally, I'd like to see for every 100,000 population center, there's an open source research and development facility like this around the world. 
Yeah, absolutely. I th it's, it's, it's very exciting that, that we have the opportunity to do these kind of things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing that's amazing to me is that um, just the amount of knowledge that we can capture and put together like at no other time in history because of the internet. And we're building upon that. Uh, our, our approach to that is working with a lot of subject matter experts, deliberately seeking out those people who are the best in the world to help us open source this stuff. Um, because when you look at, I mean, when you look at the details, typically whenever there's something that actually works, you know, there's whole tons of so-called open source stuff out there. But when it comes to real economically feasible, productive, like well-developed things, that's actually very, very rare. And that's what we're trying to address, that we actually take these things to final products that, are, that still remain open source. Because the enclosure of good product is typically what happens, like for example, with a MakerBot thing or an open source 3D printer, they turn proprietary after they've built upon all the open source knowledge and things like that. Uh, I'm saying that it's rare for, for open enterprise to exist, but the power of that is just so immense because once it's there, it can spread throughout the world and people can access the best practices for everything instead of having to reinvent the wheel. So, I mean, the returns on that, on, on people engaging in open economic development, they are huge. And our goal is to find those people who really understand that and can work like that, operate like that to develop products. It's really, you know, how, how quickly can we build an army of open source product developers who authentically share all their knowledge and then help help the entire world. I mean, that's some magnanimous goal. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm just picturing uh, me being able to walk into a Lowe's or a Home Depot and see a construction kit there that I can purchase. Uh, maybe it's the brick lane uh, construction kit and or a, a backhoe construction kit. You know, let's take that home and build it and it's being sold by company a and then um a so mm -hmm. company a is is all they had to do was take what has been developed by a community and package package it as their own and sell it and then sell that product now also company b could do the exact same thing as company a there you have the uh, they're still using the open source uh design to build their own product, maybe it's made out of a different metal or something yeah. like that. And it's it's just increasing innovation into that open source product every time yeah. they develop a way to uh, a camp company A is trying to beat company yeah. B and fails. They're innovating. It's just adding to the open source uh, project and making it better and better and better. And and then me as the consumer, I have all these great choices and all these right. innovations happening where I can just take it home build this awesome thing and go, I can build another one or build, uh, take another construction set or, uh, or a module uh, construction set from the same store to add on to my existing construction set uh, to build an excavator instead of the backhoe or tra transform that yeah. backhoe into an excavator, things like that. I, that would be a wonderful yeah. thing to see. Right. It's really the, the, I, we've identified that the cultural barrier to that is it's not a feasibility barrier because we're showing that this is all feasible technically, but it's just that people have to participate in that. They have to engage, engage themselves for us as a volunteer project. We've had a lot of turnover, but we're saying, okay, in order to have people stay and continue working on this, we have to develop viable economic models. And that's why we're, our next step is to get really focused on certain products that we can sell and market, whether it's in our, our extreme manufacturing workshops or otherwise, because that you have to make this part of your livelihood to, to, you know, to believe it. But yeah, that's the audience right now of people who are really willing to do that. It's remarkably small. It's like, you know, I, you know, just to share what, what I thought about at the very, very beginnings of this project, I thought that, okay, after the TED talk or even earlier, you know, this idea is obviously extremely powerful, the, the open economy kind of concept. But when it comes down to it, there are so few people that are actually willing to engage it in a 
in a whole wholesome way. And that's that's part of the learnings because it's it's you basically have to say okay, you know, reboot the system, forget about the system. Uh, we can do it otherwise, and the social pressure or economic pressure for just about anybody is huge. People with you know saddled with debt, you know, debt gets in the way a lot. A lot of people lo would love to do this, but they're in debt and they have to pay pay off their loans or whatever. So there's a lot of barriers that that stand in the way, but I think it's primarily the cultural barrier. It's what people are thinking. Um, well, I think it's um, an investors, uh, the way the investors are thinking, because if I uh, t take an open source ecology product uh, or, or, or project and create it into a product and take it to an investor and say, hey, I have this great machine that I want to sell. And then the investors saying, well, uh, let me see your patent or let me see. Right that you own this product. Well, no, it's an open source product. And that's where the investors go, oh, I'm not, I don't want to um, get into that battle. And uh, I right. think that's a huge barrier um, that, that uh, is understandable, but it just needs to, it just means smarter investment and the way you invest and how right. you invest. Yeah, indeed, it's a cultural shift, yeah. Um, okay, so I want to take it to the questions. Uh, now, uh, you had talked about uh, 3D printing. Do you still have that polycarbonate, that 3D printed polycarbonate? Oh, yeah. It's right here. What you're doing with 3D printing, what 3D printers can do, I think is amazing. And I was very excited uh, for, oh, hold on a second. Uh, I was very excited for you to um, say, that you're doing a 3D printer workshop or you're building a 3D printer and one will be coming to the United States. Yeah, there's a first workshop in Belgium in September and we're looking at it one about middle of December. So that's actually, not, you know, like our reward structure for the Kickstarter. I actually would encourage you, if you can, do support us and sign up for that because we are planning that for December. The first one's gonna be in September. We already ran one in March where we built 12 3D printers in one day, people gathered around, and uh, we did that at the Kaufman Foundation Center in Kansas City. People came from different parts of the country, walked out with their 3D printer. So we're doing it again, now focusing on a much more stable, flexible design. Like I mentioned about the construction set approach, you create a system which allows you to use smaller or larger parts you can use longer parts and so forth but design it with the scalability in mind such that you can use that as a 3d printer but for us we are really interested in a cnc torch table and this system will, will allow us to do it it's based primarily on steel so steel shaft like one inch shaft and 3d printed parts for the actual carriages and other things so focusing between steel and 3d printed parts we're looking at a, a very low cost design that's fully scalable. So um, if you wanna sign up for it, we don't have it in the actual Kickstarter, but we're gonna add that. So we're gonna make a note on that because the 3D printer is one of those things that are so far evolved. I mean, the, the community, the RepRap community that has developed that over the years is that's perhaps the number one open source project hardware in the world. In fact, like all of the 3D printer consumer industry, like MakerBot and uh, uh, Ultimaker, other huge companies, they're all based on that project. Basically that project has created the entire consumer 3D printer industry. So there's a lot of, that, that world is pretty much fully open source and we're simply building upon that. For us, the particular goals are things like like plumbing fittings that don't exist. It's up to printing rubber tracks for the tractors and this polycarbonate glazing. And because uh, imagine, I mean, if you could take the scrap stream and build yourself this extremely advanced polycarbonate multi-wall glazing, you can, you can design it for twin wall or quadruple wall or however much you like. Yeah, and I, I look at uh, I obviously things from a very uh, uh, permaculture and community-based uh, view. And so I'm imagining if I have, first of all, I don't even have to design this 3D printer. It's the design exactly. out there. I can build these 3D printers at my house in my community. And mm -hmm. I can say to the community, hey, all you got to do is 
bring in some recycled materials. Whenever you have recycled materials, go ahead and drop them off here. This, you know, exactly. And, and then when you need a part or a piece, it's, I, I just charge for my time or I charge whatever I want, whatever the market in the community will, will be able to handle. Maybe I trade for, for different things. Mm -hmm. Just, just give me a couple bushels of, of corn or wheat or whatever um, yeah. every year and, and I'll print you whatever you need based on the materials that you provide me. I, that's, yeah. I, I, there's huge, I mean, what a huge advantage to any community. That would be, uh, there's, there's large, I mean, people are uh, making, uh, I saw uh, in your video, you, someone built a drill out of a 3D printer. So you build mm -hmm. a power tool, a power tool out of a 3D printer. That was amazing. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's indeed right. For us, we want to also print some of the larger things like, like, I don't know, things like worm, worm bins, any kind of like a say black soldier fly reactor or various conical vessels and things like that really useful objects. So that really changes your relationship to plastic because instead of looking at it as, oh man, this is waste and into the burn barrel or whatever, it becomes a valuable product. And you can recycle things like your milk jugs. All this now becomes priceless. You can, because you can totally reconfigure it to useful objects. Yeah, that is. Oh, yeah, great. yeah, yeah. You see, it's all of a sudden you're going, no, don't go recycling that. Give it to me. Yeah. Bro, yeah. give me your trash so I can build something amazing with it. Right. And the, the various associated enterprises around that, you can be hosting 3D printer workshops where people build their own to take home. You can be making 3D printer filament, which you can then sell and right off the scrap stream. Yeah. yeah. And then the bigger application, I just saw recently there's a, a guy who's taken, a, this is in Colombia, Bogota, Bogota uh, who's making plastic lumber, which actually like fits like bricks. He, he basically takes the all the plastic trash and extrudes it into these brick-like structures that snap together into walls. And that's, that's pretty cool too. It, plastic lumber. I mean, that, that thing would last forever. That could be a great, great um, use. Like for example, you have sawdust and plastic, you can make plastic lumber composites and that's also a related machine. So that's also in our, the, the bioplastic extruders within the global village construction set. We'd like to do that, basically do things like making the plastic lumber or anything else with that. Oh, yeah. And then if you don't need the structure anymore, you don't just throw out the wood or burn it. Mm -hmm. you, you, it's plastic. You're melting it down and building new lumber uh, to the new. Grind it down again. That's right. So, so this infrastructure allows you to go quite far on the closed material supply chains, indeed. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, Nicholas had a question. Uh, he said, you, you said something about using waste heat from mm -hmm. the greenhouse to heat the house. Now, yeah. I heard uh, Ben Falk of Whole System Design speak about, and Ben will be on the show uh, later. But yeah. uh, um, he, he talked about using heat from a greenhouse to attempt to heat an attached barn. His take was yeah. that it was a disaster as the attached structure became a condensation trap as it was cooler. Yeah and the, the waste heat from the greenhouse was very moist. Uh, what are your yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, if you use air-to-air -air heat exchangers, that will happen. For us, we're actually using hydronics, so we're running a line from an, a, a water line, essentially, a PEX, PEX tubing line out of the existing stove to heat the greenhouse. So in a case like this, what we would do is just run another line from the original heat source into the new structure. And that's, you, you'd have to trench for that if it's separated, if it's adjacent, you'd hardly have to do any of that. But it depends how you do it. That, that could be an issue. Indeed, the, the greenhouse air is quite moist. For us in the house, it's actually work, working out pretty well because the, the winter air is pretty dry. So opening up the greenhouse in the winter gets us nice moisture into the house, which for us here works well in our particular building. So there's different ways you can do that. And then with the more advanced air-to-air -air heat exchangers, you can probably take that energy and while avoiding the moisture, but that would be much higher technology. Yeah, and Robert had a comment saying your, hydro your, uh, uh, your hydronic coils could be used as a, a ground source heat pump. Yeah, yep. 
All right, uh, Alfred. Alfred Same technology. asked, "Would you would you ever consider selling IP as a revenue stream?" And we we hit pretty hard on that. But what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, if someone wants to pay us for what we publish, please go ahead. But um, the the concept of that is we can charge for early release materials. I mean, our general statement on that is, if you're making a barrier towards innovation, don't do it generate your revenue elsewhere, like produce real products. Don't, don't charge for that, which is free for you to distribute. Like if it, if you're publishing a book and it takes you months to publish it, to create it, yeah, you should probably charge for it. But if it's, if it's no effort for you, it's like, just give it away, uh, allow it, innovation to happen as a result of that. And, and look at it as an investment into some other people making further developments that you can then capture back. It, it benefits everybody. So we favor keeping the barriers to entry low as much as we can. Okay, so as I was, Marjan, I was hoping you could walk us through an emergent build training workshop, like what it entails, what I'm going to experience by going to one of these workshops and mm -hmm. how I can sign up for one of these workshops. Right, let's talk about a few upcoming ones. First is a brick press build. That one is, in that one, we're gonna build a complete brick press in a matter of two days. The first day will be immersion training will teach you a little bit about welding, about torching and other grinders and hand tools so that on the second day you're ready to pretty much participate fully in the build. The build is designed so it's the most simple possible. A large number of people come together. They work in parallel on different parts of the machine. So this is where the module-based design comes in. The team works together in parallel on multiple stations so there would be like six welding stations or whatever and then we get to build a complete machine including the electronics and hydraulics all in that single day so that's that's the beauty of it it's an immersion kind of a depth experience where you get to see how the industrial process works on a small scale of flexible fabrication you meet friends where um, a lot of times we actually get the comment that the best thing that people don't know what to expect of these workshops, but they end up leaving saying that, wow, this is uh, the best thing they are getting out of it is the pe people they met and the interesting conversations they had. Because it's typically a lot of your, your freedom lover audience, people who are uh, trying to take responsibility into their hands and, and be productive. So it's a good crowd of people. That's the Brick Press workshop. We're gonna build a, a 3D printer that's gonna be in Belgium first actually, but that's, that's once again, a one or two day workshop where you walk out with a wor working 3D printer that you build in that single day. Once again, it's the parallel type of build where uh, you work in uh, using very simple procedures. We, we designed the, the machine to be as simple as possible with a minimal parts to count, and that applies to everything. So the big workshops we do have are the five-day builds of the structures, like, like the aquaponic greenhouse of the house. For example, last year, the, the aquaponic greenhouse was where we built, in, in the workshop, we build all the framed modules, then we take them up to the site and assemble them the same day. So we built all the, the vertical wall modules, like 10 different teams working in parallel in a workshop using saws and drills and all of that. Um, then we assemble at the same day. So then two days we actually built the whole walls and, and the roof structures and then we filled it in with the different systems like the ponds. We installed the ponds, the growing towers, we built that and the growing beds and other systems, mushrooms, we installed mushroom growing system and started some trays of seed and seeded that with fish at that time and put in some duckweed and azola into into the system yeah but, actually uh, uh i have we have a great video on exactly that on on the mm -hmm. aquaponics workshop i'd like to show that right now we're pleased to announce our second open source aquaponic greenhouse workshop have you ever dreamed of having your own greenhouse so you can grow fresh food all year and heat your house in the winter we have and that's why we built our first aquaponic greenhouse last year it's an 800 square foot space that includes two in-ground ponds, tilapia fish, chickens, hydronic heating, growing towers, growing beds, worm towers, mushrooms, more vertical growing shelves, and Internet of Things monitoring. And we're going to do it again this fall. 
Join us in this workshop to learn how to build, equip, and maintain an open source greenhouse. Support our Kickstarter and get an early bird discount on our aquaponic greenhouse workshop. Right. And the way, um, so the way we typically do that, we have people sign up on Eventbrite for those events and uh, people come on site. They're welcome to camp out. Um, we pretty much have shared meals here. Some people are just get a hotel in a nearby town, but it's a, it's a real immersion. You just really get your hands on in a, in a very diverse array of, of tasks. So as opposed to going to school and, you know, spending weeks or months or years learning something, our goal is to introduce people to a, this total immersion of a large number of, of productive tasks hands on. So it's, you know, part of it is we talk a little bit about the theory of what we're doing and about open source ecology, open building Institute, and then we get right into action with our hands right now. We're actually, uh, as far as the current way, we do have some of these offerings through the Kickstarter because we're raising money to kick off the Open Building Institute. So you can actually sign up for the Brick Press Workshop, the Aquapana Greenhouse Workshop, the House Build, and the 3D Printer Workshop right through the Kickstarter. And that would actually help us out because we're still pretty much in the middle of that. The, we're on track, but we definitely need help to, to succeed at that. So you can sign up there. Otherwise, after the Kickstarter in about 25 days, We'll be posting that those events up on Eventbrite to get more people to sign up. But right now, it's a the, the Kickstarter is favorable in the sense that we've got early bird admissions on there, so we can take advantage of that. Yeah, and there's huge. It, it looks like there's some pretty big benefits of going through the Kickstarter to to get onto these workshops um, as well yeah. as an early bird adopter. Um, now, one of the workshops you. you it see it seemed understated. I don't think um, maybe people don't understand how awesome. <laughs> 3D printer workshop is you you're going to build people are you're going to be able to build a 3D printer in one day I don't think mm -hmm. anybody's done that before I think normally it takes like five days a couple weeks to do something yeah like yeah let me talk about that actually we looked into this and we looked at who else is offering that nobody is actually the, the closest we found was maybe three days um, but as a regular offering that's our goal, that we have a turnkey product where you do that in a single way. That means that we redesign the machine like right now. So we ran the first one on in March of this year. It took us pretty much to like 10 p.m. to do that. We were aiming for like <laughs> finishing by 5 p.m., but it, yeah, it's, it takes longer. Uh, so we're streamlining based on those learnings, now making reducing the parts count, and we certainly saw how if you focus on that, you can definitely do it. So we look forward to that. But it, it is amazing that, that you, because it's open source and all the components, you know, your little Arduino controller, they're all available and all the circuit diagrams and software is there. So it's pretty much all this assembly that you can do from pretty much turnkey off the shelf parts, which is like, wow, this is pretty good because over the years, you could not get a 3D printer that works, but right now the technology has evolved so much that you get a very decent printer, even with things like automatic bed leveling, where there's a little probe which senses how far you are from the working table so that all of your prints start out correctly and all that. That's like, you know, that part right there costs like three bucks, you know, so, it, so it's, it's quite affordable and you can walk out with paying like 300 or so in materials. Definitely you can get a high quality printer on a small size. And then for the much larger ones, like the CNC torch table scale, I mean, that's going to be more money uh, based on the amount of metal that's in there. But we're pretty much going to steel. Steel is robust and cheap. Uh, most people building 3D printers are focusing on aluminum, but that's actually much more expensive. So we're going to that which we know a lot, and that's steel, and it's cheaper and stronger, actually. Yeah, so. and easier to easier to get your hands on, and I think too. Yeah, um, and and I think it's important for people to understand this isn't just for. It's not. What's great about this is it isn't for a niche group. This is for 
I mean, you could be, all right, oh, the, a big one for people is preppers. Preppers want it because if something hits the, you know, this, the shit hits the fan and, um, and maybe there's an economic collapse or whatever, you can build things using a 3D yeah. printer that you otherwise would have a difficult time getting. But it's not just for that. It's also for people that have a community where you want to be able to provide a valued product and mm -hmm. a huge amount of value of productivity to everybody mm -hmm. in the community or for someone that's just has it in their workshop where they need custom parts so that they can build um, uh, custom products that no one else could based off yeah. of planet. I mean, the, 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 this is for everybody. You could, everybody. Yeah. Can use one of these. Right. You know, if you talk about the doomsday scenario, you got yourself a 3D printer in a junkyard, and now you can print out all your plumbing, you can do glazing for your greenhouse, you can do all kinds of useful other objects. Or one thing that actually part particularly excites me is the, the small cordless power tool construction set. I mean, a drill is a battery, a motor, a chuck, and a bunch of plastic in a complex shape, which otherwise is pretty difficult. But if you have a 3D printer, that's such a great application. I'm really actually surprised why nobody's going producing that. Uh, I think probably the reason is that those things, you know, drills, disposable drills are, you know, so cheap. But it does make a lot of sense because then you can turn those, those drills into lifetime design machines because you can always print out a new part, get a new part. If you built it, you have total ownership of it. If you didn't build it, you don't own it. And so, and then another note on that, we had, you know, we had house moms and techie, techie guys or whoever come to the workshop and they were able to participate and build their own printer. So it's, it's really neat to see a mom and a child or example like that. And they're so happy when they see the thing work. It's, it's pretty amazing. Oh yeah. And oh man, kids, if I had one of these things when I was a kid, all the yeah. amount of toys I would have would be ridiculous. <laughs> right. And that's where it's headed is that yes, even a kid could plug in a toy they want yeah. and be able to print a toy they want based off of recycled materials they get out of the trash. And that's yeah. huge. Um, and, and I'm thinking, hey, man, if I'm a mechanic, I want, uh, or, a, or a weapon manufacturer, I want to see, just a, or a, a, mm -hmm. a, a sewer where I'm just building in my own house. I want a CNC machine. I want a lathe and I want a 3D printer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So I want to talk a little bit more about module building just to, for, for people to fully understand, it's not just about being able to expand, although it does do this very well, to be able to expand a single device. It's being able to take a part one device and build a completely different device like a to go from a backhoe to a bulldozer or, and or a micro track mm -hmm. things like that could you expand a little bit about more on that right we have a number of modules that we've developed and actually i can actually send you a link because we are creating a construction set that's based on the structural frame tubing the modular power units the universal rotors, various times, types of bonding plates, and then specialized components, but largely bolt together so that the same material structures go in, like the tractor is made of a frame. It's got your engines, it's got your wheels, it's got your loader or whatever. Um, well, because it's bolted together, you can take it apart, you can take out, snap out the power cube, use it in a different machine. So literally you can convert your tractor, you can, you can put on the track module. The tracks are a separate module. You can put that on with idlers and now you got a tracked bulldozer. You know, you have a blade as a specialized part or the backhoe bucket as a specialized part. But with, with the box tubing, you, you have frames and frames can have articulated joints they can bend side to side. You can so you can have things like the like the articulated backhoe and various things. But essentially, you bolt you unbolt it into a different structure. I mean, the best model is take a rector set, take Lego set. It's essentially the life size rector set for building real hardware. And then power cubes. 
Uh, you can stack them likewise. Each each one of ours are are 27 horsepower. So you want 54 horse, you take two of those. Our goal is to. I think the practical limit is like eight of them at the same time. I think it would still be quite practical. So you got a, a bulldozer with 200 horsepower or so. So the flexibility is completely there. And uh, the good thing about the hydraulics, actually, I, I will mention this other point because it integrates well with with solar power, actually, because if you have hydraulics, if you have very little power, that means that you're producing very little fluid, but it still typically occurs at the same pressure. So you can have, say, a single solar panel, a tiny power cube, a solar power cube, which we've built, uh, a micro, we call it paracute, a tiny one horsepower power cube. But even with a, one or a couple of uh, solar panels, you can run a tiny pump, tiny hydraulic pump, which it may not have the flow, it might have like a you know half a gallon per minute flow, but it still has that 3,000 pounds per square inch. So what we've done is, for example, with a tractor, we took one of these one horsepower power cubes and we put it on our, we plugged it into the wall because it was electric, and we ran our 6,000 pound tractor gorilla with that. It was moving at 14 feet per minute, but it had all the torque that you needed to do heavy tasks. So imagine taking your tractor when you're not using it, it's, you know, instead of sitting in the shed, you got it out in your field with a solar panel with GPS and it's doing key line plowing for you autonom autonomously, things like that, or dragging around chicken tractors. So that's actually what we're aiming to do right here. Uh, we actually are advertising this one workshop for next year, which is the eco tractor build which will be a tractor that runs either on a solar with a micro power, solar power cube, or it has a gasifier on it, and it has biohydraulic fluid, which is essentially canola oil with some additives. So we're kind of really positioning as this super ecological tractor that runs off solar and natural, um, natural hydraulic fluid gasifier uh, control pellets. So that all, so it's fueled locally or from the sun. So all solar energy. Uh, so our super eco tractor. That's actually a build that we're gonna do next year. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is amazing. That would be that'd be. Yeah. The, in my so we're looking forward to it. I mean the. Yeah, I mean the gasifier. The gasifier based on charcoal works extremely well. Um, that does not have the tar problems. It's just a very simple system where you light it and the gas goes into your your fuel intake. And it just works. We did that last year. It was great, great first, first, first prototype. Oh yeah, I think gasification is a, a great technology, very old technology too. Yeah. Um, but uh, man, you can grow your own fuel. That, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And same with solar. Of course, solar has. Um, I mean, people, the, the innovation, where it's going. Well, the, the amount of power we're being able to to produce from solar is, is uh, spectacular, and yeah, it's just yeah, I, I yeah. Think any just a, even a regular farmer that's got a big field he needs to get done, he's got a GPS on there, and he can set that thing to just uh, run off solar. That would be an amazing, uh, amazing. Innovation. Well, let me let me expand on that in terms of open source because I don't know how much he paid for his system, but using open source, a simple Arduino with a GPS thing, you're getting the automatic controls for about, for the microprocessor and, and the GPS, it's like 50 bucks. And if you've got the hydraulic solenoids, they cost as much as a regular, soleno, uh, regular hand valve. So you can get a solenoid valve for like a hundred bucks for a 10 gallon per minute valve. So you're literally paying as little as about, it's under a hundred bucks to get the GPS capacity with current technology. It's amazing. Oh yeah, and these guys, uh, these, these large scale farmers are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on, these, uh, on this equipment. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, well, in my, in my mathematics, a hundred dollars is much less than a thousand. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah the and the uh what this does is it opens up the market to a lot more people that would like to do similar yeah. things on a smaller scale they otherwise couldn't afford that this type of equipment right it, to me the open source is the enabler at this technological juncture 
in human, human history, it's an enabler of the localized economy. It allows you to do so many diverse tasks and feasibly and efficiently. Absolutely. Uh, now, Nicholas had a question. Are you considering scaling up the power cube that you mentioned to a, a larger unit uh, for larger design? And uh, I have an add-on question. Are you thinking about, is that a diesel or, or, or uh, mm -hmm. what, what are the pluses and minuses of diesel? Yeah, we definitely are planning larger ones, but that's going to be once we actually make engines ourselves. That's part of the Global Village construction set, the precision machining to allow to do that. For now, we're using simple gasoline engines simply because of the price point. We can right now get a $900, get you 27 horsepower. Uh, for diesel, it would be much more expensive. We like the idea of plain gasoline because it allows the very easy retrofit of the gasifier. And, and that means easy local fuel as opposed to oils and diesels. So we're actually currently favoring the gasoline route for the gasifier conversion. As far as immediate scaling, we are planning, so right now the, the original power cube is, is 27 horsepower engines, which cost $900. However, we just noticed that you can get an 18 horsepower engine for $300 with everything. So it actually makes more sense to build a power cube with three individual 18 horsepower engines so that you can get 54 horsepower for the price that you would otherwise pay uh, for 27 horsepower. Just because the smaller engines are cheaper and then you have what you do is you have a hydraulic pump on each of the engines using the same common reservoir. Um, but the idea is that each hydraulic pump, it's just a tiny, tiny little device that fits in your, your hand and produces all that hydraulic fluid flow at high pressure. Those are a hundred bucks, so quite, quite affordable these days. So it actually makes more sense to go with multiple smaller units than the larger ones. So we can fit three of these engines into one, one power cube frame and have 54 horsepower as the basis. So we're looking at that as a, as actually an, a decent step just on a price point because yeah, we want to keep the price down to make an affordable, small scale tractor. And I think, uh, <laughs> I think there's something to be said about having these multiple smaller engines as opposed to one larger engine in that, um, yeah, on the farm, I need, I'm moving things around. I have to rob Peter to pay Paul. I'm, I'm moving. Uh, I need to get the pump going. For some reason, the pump in the well has gone out. I can borrow one of those engines for that while still having mm -hmm. power for other things, as opposed to dedicating my whole one big engine to pumping water out of a well. Things like Right. That. It's true. That does follow the principle of biomimicry. The idea is that a tree or a human is made of billions of cells as opposed to like one big cell. So the multiple smaller units does, does provide for sound, sound design in terms of resilience. Now, uh, Robert had a question about the, uh, the, the brick builder. Uh, <laughs> will the compressed block machine take dirt or of any clay content? You have to have about 30% clay content in it for it to work. If you have too much sand, the bricks will crumble. If you have too much clay, the bricks will crack. So you have to be in the sweet spot of about 30%, like 20 to 30%. Now, if you have less favorable soil, you can use additives like, like Portland cement or lime cement to work with more sandy or more clay soils. Mm -hmm. In the worst case scenario, you, would, you could ship in soil, get a truck load for a hundred bucks to your site if you don't have the right soil. Like if you live on a beach, you're going to have sand. You can't really press with that. Yeah. And uh, I would say that if you're going to, if you're in the need of soil, you're probably also in the need of uh, a pond. I think everybody is. Oh yeah. Especially if you're in the flatlands, it, it, being able to build a pond in the flatlands, you end up with a lot of extra material and hopefully you get a lot of clay content out of that. Stave some off to the side so that when you want to do one of these things, you can mix in that extra clay yeah. content with, with your, uh, your soil. Right. The, the good idea is if you're building your house, you want to use that, that pit that you dug and make that into a pond as your water source. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I just want to take one more question, and that's from Darren. Uh, Darren asks, how are you building code? How are building codes and inspections mm -hmm. honored on the on-site five-day builds? Or are these mm -hmm. via uh, like a pre-build submission? Or are they mm -hmm. uh, uh, property where you can just do these kind of things without legal repercussions? Our particular property, we don't have a building department, so we can do whatever we want here. But for zone jurisdictions, you have to you'd have to go to your building department and show them what you're doing and get the pre-approval, and that will vary from your 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 case by case case by case basis. But our goal is to provide all the supporting engineering documents, uh, plan, site plan, all the all the components of a checklist of what a building department would require, so that can be facilitated. And maybe there's some places where it's you have to go through extra red tape, but um, in principle, the idea is this: we have to go through all the hoops that any other builder would go through. Now, you're you're um, getting an engineer to sign off on an open source uh, design. It's got to be very difficult, and you're mm -hmm. looking for those engineers. You need yeah. those engineers. Um, how can they get a hold of you? Um, and and what kind of engineers are you looking for? Yeah. Exactly. If there's any structural engineer for foundations or structures or even electrical, please contact us. So that's something we want to submit to the building department. If somebody could sign off on that, that would be amazing. And so far, we, we don't know of anybody that would do that. But if you'd like to help us out on that, if you're, a, if you're an engineer, engineer with a license, contact me at marchin at opensourceecology.org. That would be the best place. We definitely want that kind of support because we want to make it as easy as possible for all the people that are going to be replicating it. And I think at some point, once we have a few stable models, then, and hopefully if it's spreading far and wide, then a building department will say, oh yeah, that's one of your, your open building institute houses. Here you go. Yeah. All right. So it's a Creating Thank you a, very a, much for being with us, Marchin. What you much for being with us, Marchin. What you're doing is extremely important uh, to the world, and it's extremely important to to our community. And yeah, uh, applaud you and thank you very much for being on the show. Uh, next week, guys, we have uh, Akiva Silver from Twisted Tree Farm, Tree Farm joining us. Uh, for more information about uh, Marchin and what he's doing, see opensourceecology.org. All the links talked about today, all the videos are in the show notes. Have a great day, guys. Thank you.